Mars and its Canals by Percival Lowell, Chapter 29, Life. Study of the fundamental features of Martian topography has disclosed, as we have seen, the existence of vegetation on the planet as the only rational explanation of the markings there, considered not simply on the score of their appearance momentarily, but judged by the changes that appearance undergoes at successive seasons of the Martian year. Thus, we are assured that plant life exists on the planet. We are made aware of the fact in more ways than one, but most unanswerably for that trait to which vegetation owes its very name, its periodic quickening to life. Thus, the characteristic which has seemed here most distinctive of this phase of the organic, so that man even christened it in accordance, has proved equally telltale there. Important as a conclusion, this is no less pregnant as a premise. For the assurance that plant life exists on Mars leads to a further step in extra-mundane acquaintance of far-reaching import. It introduces us at once to the probability of life there of a higher and more immediately appealing kind, not with the vagueness of general analogy, but with the definitiveness of specific deduction. For the presence of a flora is itself ground for suspecting a fauna. Of a bond connecting the two, we get our first hint the moment we look inquiringly into the world about us, that of our own earth. Common experience witnesses to a coexistence which grows curious and compelling as we consider it, for it is not confined to life of any special order, but extends through the whole range of organisms of both kinds from the lowest to the highest. Algae and monera, orchid and mammal, occur side by side and with a certain considerate poverty or richness as the case may be. Luxuriance in the one is matched by abundance in the other while a scanty flora means a poor fauna. This, of which we have been aware in regions round about us from childhood, grows in universality as we explore. Wherever man penetrates out of his proper sphere, he finds the same dual possession of the land or the sea, and a similar curtailing or expanding of both tenantries together. No mountaintop so cold, but that if it grows plants, it supports insects and animals too, after its kind. No desert so arid, but that creeping things find it as possible a habitat as life that does not stir. Even in almost boiling geysers, animalcula and confervi share and share alike. Only where extreme conditions preclude the one, do they equally debar the other. Proceeding now from the fact to its factors, we perceive reasons for this tenure in common of the land by the vegetal and animal kingdoms. Examination proves the two great divisions of the organic to be inextricably connected. It strikes our notice first in the relation of plants to animals. It is of everyday notoriety that animals eat plants, though it is less universally understood that in the ultimate they exist on nothing else. Plants furnish the food of animals, not as a matter of partial preference, but of fundamental necessity. For the plant is the indispensable intermediary in the process of metabolism. Without plants, animals would soon cease to exist, since they are unable to manufacture their own plasm out of the raw material offered by inorganic nature. They must make it out of the already prepared plasm of plants, or out of other animals who have made it from plants so that in the end it all comes back to plant production. The plant is able to build its plasm out of chemical substances. The animal cannot, except in the case of the nitrobacteria, begin thus at the lowest rung of the elementary ladder. But the converse of this dependence is also largely true. Plants are beholden to animals for processes that, in return, make their own life possible. The latter minister to the former with unconscious service all the time, and with no more arrogant independence than do our domestics generally nowadays. The inconspicuous earthworm is the field hand of nature's crops, who gets his own living by making theirs. Without this day and night laborer, the soil, for want of stirring, had remained less capable of grass. Above ground, it is the same story. Deprived of the ministrations of insects, many kinds of plants would incontinently perish. By the solicited visits of bees and other hymenoptera, what generally may be classed by the layman as flutterbys, is the plant's propagation made possible. Peculiarly well-named indeed are the hymenoptera, seeing that they are the great matrimonial go-betweens, carrying pollen from one individual to another, 
and thus uniting what otherwise could not meet. Spectacular as this widespread commerce is, it forms but portion of the daily drama in which animals and plants alike take part. From forthright bargainings of honey for help, we pass to the less discreet but no less effective alliance where plants are beholden to animals for life by the killing of their enemies or by the weeding out of their competitors, and from this to generic furtherance where the interdependence becomes more broadcast. In the matter of metabolism, the advantage is not all on one side. In the catabolic process of that which each discards are these two classes mutually complementary the waste of the one being the want of the other, carbonic acid being given off by the animal, oxygen by the plant. In biologic economy, it is daily more demonstrable that both are necessary constituents for an advancing whole, and that each pays for what it gets by what it gives in return. That they are thus ancillary as well as coexistent today leads us to confront for them a community of origin in the past, and further study confirms the inference. Both paleontology and entomology, or the science of the aged and the science of the young, prove such ancestry to be a fact. By going back from the present into the past, or what amounts to substantially the same thing, by descending in the scale of life to the lowest known forms of organism, we find proof of concomitance, cogent because congenital. At the time when inorganic chemical compounds first passed by evolution into organic ones, the change was of so general a character that even such tardy representatives of it as survive today tax erudition to tell to which of the two great kingdoms they belong, the vegetal or the animal. <clears throat> Simplest and most primitive of known organisms are the chromachi, unnucleated single cells as Haeckel has shown, and, next to them in order, come many of the bacteria, also of simple unnucleated plasm. So little do the majority of bacteria differ morphographically from the chromachi that on the score of structure the two are not to be catalogued apart. Both are as elemental as anything well can be, which only their diet serves to divide. Each is an organism without organs, thus belying the dictionary definition of both animals and plants. Etymologically, they are not organic, yet manifestly they are alive, and only in their action are unlike. The chromachi are of plasm-forming beings, and therefore they are plants. The bacteria are plasm-eating beings, and so are animals. Even this distinction is not always preserved. As Haeckel tells us, the nitrobacteria which dwell in the earth, having the vegetal property of converting ammonia by oxidation into nitrous acid, and this into nitric acid, using as their source of carbon the carbonic acid gas of the atmosphere. They feed, like the chromachi, on simple inorganic compounds. Here then we have, close to the threshold of organic life, unorganized organisms, roughly speaking, coeval and differing in a sense but little, either of them, from inorganic crystals. And yet, one is an animal, the other a plant. Progenitors of the two great divisions of life, they were themselves concomitantly evolved, either side by side, or as offshoots both of a common stock. Now, if the ancestors of the two great kingdoms were thus simultaneously produced here, we are warranted in believing that they would similarly be produced elsewhere, given conditions suitably alike. In consequence, if we detect the presence of the one, we already have an argument for inferring the other. Not to complete our syllogism would be to flaunt a lack of logic in nature's face. Rationally viewed, then, the general problem of life in other worlds reduces itself to a question of conditions. Since certain physical results follow inevitably upon certain physical premises, if we can assure ourselves of the proper premises, we may look to nature for their conclusion. A priori, then, the possibility of life becomes one of habitat. If the environment be suitable, life will ensue. What makes for such a mediary milieu is, like most cosmic processes, in its fundamentals of interesting simplicity. For the production of a proper nidus depends primarily upon the mere size of the body parentally concerned. If a planet be big enough, it will inevitably bring forth life, because of conditions suitable to its generating. 
if too small, it will remain sterile to the end of time. That size should be the determining factor whether a planet shall be fecund or barren may seem at first thought strange. Yet that it is so admits of no rational doubt. All that we see of bodies about us shows its truth. And what we have learnt of cosmic process enables us in some sort to discern why. In order for evolution, such as we mark it upon Earth, to be possible, the parent body must have been at one time at a high temperature, since only under great heat can the primal processes occur. But for this generation of caloric, the aggregate mass of the particles, the falling together of which makes the planet and their stoppage its internal heat, must be large. The sun's rays alone are insufficient to cause the necessary temperature. The heat must come from within, though it be helped from without. Even here, the action is abetted by a large body. For a planet to entrap the sun's rays, or even to preserve its own internal warmth, an atmosphere is needed, and it takes a large body to retain an atmosphere covering sufficiently long. Yet without it, not only would there be no suitable state, but no medium in which organic or even inorganic reactions could go on. Lastly, water, the essential nidus for the organism's early stages, has its presence similarly conditioned. For this, like the atmosphere, would from a small body speedily vanish away. Thus, the planet itself is the life-producing body, although the sun furthers the process when once begun. That the needed substances are planetarily present, what we know of the distribution of matter astronomically sufficiently attests. What we find in meteorites shows that the catastrophe which preceded our present solar system's birth scattered its elemental constituents throughout its domain, and thus, when they came to be gathered up again into planets, that these must have been materially the same. The manner, not the matter, then, is alone that about which we are concerned. Now, if the mass of matter gravitating together to form a planet be sufficient to produce the proper inorganic conditions, the organic must follow as a matter of course. That the organic springs from the inorganic is not only shown by what has taken place on Earth, but is the necessary logical deduction from its decay back into the inorganic again. As Nageli admirably observes, the origin of the organic from the inorganic is, in the first place, not a question of experience and experiment, but a fact deduced from the law of constancy of matter and force. If all things in the material world are causally related, if all phenomena proceed on natural principles, organisms which are formed and decay into the same matter must have been derived originally from inorganic compounds. The original oneness of the two the fact that the organic sprang from the inorganic is shown by the cousinly closeness of the lowest organic with the highest inorganic substances. The monera are suggestive of crystals in their uniformity of structure. Both are homogeneous, or approximately so. Again, both grow by taking from what they come in contact with that which they find suitable, and so add to their body by homogeneous accretion. Finally, when grown too large for single life, they part into similar crystals or split into identical cells. The difference between the division of the crystal and the fission of the cell is small in kind, much less than that later differentiation in genesis into parthenogenesis and sexual reproduction. Yet here we unhesitatingly trace an assured relationship. It were straining at a gnat to swallow a camel to doubt it in the other. Just as the two behave analogically alike in their own action, so do they observe like an attitude toward nature. They thus point to their common origin. The monera are resemblant of chemical compounds in their superiority to external influences. To outward conditions of temperature and humidity, the chromachai are much as sticks and stones. Some species may remain for long frozen in ice, Haeckel observes, and yet wake to activity so soon as it thaws. Others may be completely desiccated, and then resume their life when put in water after a lapse of several years. Thus, both in their death-like lives and in their living immortality, the chromachai are close to inorganic things. From preference, however, these lowest forms of life affect what to us would be unbearable temperatures. 
Many of the Chromakai live in hot springs at temperatures of 123 to 176 degrees Fahrenheit, in which no other, that is, no higher organism, can dwell. This choice of habitat is in line with the other details of their evolutionary career. For it, too, is in keeping with the conditions of crystalline growth. Halfway, as it were, on the road to them, the forming of crystals beginning at a temperature higher still, and we perceive from it that the passing of the inorganic into the organic is brought about by a lowering of the temperature of the parent planet. This again is in line with the evolution of chemical complexity. Let the heat become less, and higher and higher chemical compounds, finally the organic ones, become possible. That evolution is nothing else than such a gradually increasing chemical synthesis is forced on one by study of the facts. Once started, life, as paleontology shows, develops along both the floral and the faunal lines side by side, taking on complexity with time. It begins so soon as secular cooling has condensed water vapor to its liquid state, chromakai and confervae coming into being high up towards the boiling point. Then, with lowering temperature, comes seaweeds and rhizopods, then the land plants and the lunged vertebrates. Hand in hand, the fauna and flora climb to more intricate perfecting, life rising as temperature lowers. We perceive then that, considered a priori, the possibility of life on a planet is merely a question of the planet's size, and then pursuantly that the character of that life is a matter of the planet's age. But age again is a question of size. For the smaller the mass, the quicker the body cools, and with a planet, growing cold means growing old. Within the bounds that make life possible, the smaller the body, the quicker it ages and the more advanced its denizens must be. Just how far the advance goes, we may not assert dogmatically in a given case, since not relative age alone, but absolute time as well, is concerned in it. It may be that nature's processes cannot be hurried, and that for want of time, development may be in part missed. But from general considerations, the limit of the time needed seems well within most planetary careers. Now, the aspect of the surface of Mars shows that both these conditions have been fulfilled. Mars is large enough to have begotten vegetation and small enough to be already old. All that we know of the physical state of the planet points to the possibility of both vegetal and animal life existing there, and, furthermore, that this life should be of a relatively high order is possible. Nothing contradicts this, and the observations of the last ten years have rendered the conclusion then advanced only the more conclusive. Even the evidence of the past state of the planet confirms that given by its present one. That with us, life came out of the seas, finds its possible parallel in the fact that seas seemed once to have existed there, leaving their mark discernibly today. Life, then, had there, as here, the wherewith to begin. That we find air and water in both shows that it had the means to continue once begun. That it then ran a like course is further witnessed by what we now detect. The necessary premises, then, are there. More than this, one half of the conclusion, vegetal life, gives evidence of itself. End of section 31. Recording by Michael Knowles, Fort Worth, Texas.